Welcome guys to the fourth installment of our series here at Big Blind Media titled Creating Magic, the show in which we invite BBM artists and we sit down with them and we discuss their life, their career as a magician, their hobbies and also focusing on how it is to be a creator and how they create magic. Today we got the one and only, the amazing Tom Dobrowalski, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, thanks, ah. Biz. And you said, that's perfect. You said the name perfectly, by the way, which is great. Even I have trouble with that sometimes, so that's perfect. I did the practice in front of the mirror. Of the lot, the lot. <laughs> good, good idea, good idea. Yeah, thanks for having me today, by Dobrowalski. the way. Dobrowalski. Yeah. Dobrowalski. Nope. <laughs> Just say, say everything that's there. I know it's complicated, it's confusing, but it's uh, the easiest way to say it. So, But perfect. Great start. That's That's the American way to say it, right? But... It is. How would you say it in your native uh, native tongue? So my uh, most of my Polish relatives are uh, long gone that spoke Polish and stuff, but it used to be Dobrowolski. So, ah, yes, Dobrowolski. Yeah, Dobrowolski. So that's how I remember them saying it. So uh, the Americanized is Dobrowolski, but it's yeah, Dobrowolski would be the way to do say it. Do you speak Polish? I do not. I do not. My dad spoke a little. Uh, and uh, cause his parents actually came from Poland. Uh, he spoke a little, and I remember my relatives when I was really young, but I'm 63, and my dad passed away years ago, and most of his uh, Polish relatives had passed away, uh, but uh, he had, I know some Polish people that we ran into one day, my dad was trying to speak Polish to him about 10 years ago now, and uh, he struggled because he couldn't remember from when he was a kid. So he said something and they replied and they went back and forth and then he got lost pretty quickly in the conversation. Yeah. But no, I never learned. Yeah. 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 Not even a, not even a word like uh, thank you. Jankuya. I remember Jankuya for thank you. Uh, Nimazatsa, oh, I think yeah. was your welcome. And that's about the extent of it right there. And then maybe some foods like pierogi and I remember, <laughs> you know, uh, but that's about it. That's the extent these days of my Polish. I recently learned that uh, Polish is actually uh, one of the hardest languages on the planet to learn. Really? Hmm. Yeah, I just learned that like last week. I still have to fact check this thing. Right, but this right. guy was so so fascinated by Polish because he had learned uh, from a radio station that Polish is the most difficult language to learn. Really? So he started I'm learning. Yeah. Right? I'm going to check that out too, actually. Now that's, you have me curious. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit in, uh, in uh, your history with magic. I've okay. learned that you've been doing magic for over 50 years now. Yeah, right? yeah, believe it. Yeah, you think I'd be better, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're amazing. I mean, uh, you, me man. and Tom met uh, and hanged out briefly at uh, Blackpool this year. Yeah. Yeah. And I can say that the upcoming release that you're going to put out with Big Blind Media with the with the set of four tricks and one of them is that oil and water. Yes. <laughs> the, the thing about that oil and water, people are not going to be able, maybe I'll use some clips from the oil and water, but we did put it on Instagram. The thing is, I filmed it. And I saw it and I reacted. I was like, it's so good. But then I went back and I watched it. Yeah. And I was like, how did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> so and, just, uh, I watched it four, four or five times and I was like, oh, whoa. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's actually, what's interesting about that routine is it's actually uh, not that difficult to do. And uh, it's the, the big uh, payoff is just based basically on a huge bluff that just really works. So uh, that's a fun one that's to amazing. do because you know what's coming. When you're performing, you kind of know what's coming. And you know, uh, every I just did it yesterday for a group of magicians we had lunch with. And um, they yeah. absolutely never saw the ending coming. I mean, it's just, it's a, so it's a fun one to do. It's a fun one to do as well. It really, it really is. I have to yeah. agree with that, man. Blew yeah. me away, blew the spectator away that saw it. So yeah, I was just yeah. passing by the stall. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll see a trick. Yeah, sure. But then at the end, right. just kept looking down. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. yeah it's uh, while we're, uh, while we're <clears throat> one thing that I've noticed when uh, being, uh, well, going at conventions is that youngsters will hang out with youngsters. And... Right. 
Uh, then you got people of 30 hanging out with people that are like 30, 40. And then you got a very small selection of people that are elderly, like in their 60s, and they're only hanging out together with other other 60 year olds. So that's what I'm going to ask you is, have you noticed that this in America? Yes, unfortunately I have. Yeah. I did. It's the same. And it's unfortunate. There's, um, when I grew up in magic, so there was a lot of magic shops. And when I grew up in uh, magic, we had three or four in the Chicagoland area. And the one I used to go to a lot when I was younger was magic incorporated, which was owned by Jay Marshall, who was a legendary magician who was probably my age about the time I started going in and hanging out there. Uh, but back then, and I'm not sure why back then there seemed to be more of an intermixing of the ages and skill levels and stuff too, and a more of sharing of information. Uh, the, the stories about, Oh, you'd have to earn your stripes to learn some stuff and whatever. Well, that was true to a certain extent, but they seem to be more open and willing to interact with the, the younger people. And uh, it drives me crazy because I have mag magic friends of all ages. I've got one guy, a friend of mine who's a professional magician now in his uh, early 20s, who I've known since he was like eight years old. And we still continue to Whoa. hang out. Yeah, yeah. And we still continue to hang out and share information. And uh, he performs at a lot of colleges and cruise ships and all over the uh, the world, basically. And we'll still get together and we'll share information or he'll ask me, he's working on a routine, do I have any ideas or... And that's what I grew up with. So I think it's a huge mistake on on all ends yeah. of the spectrum, on both the older and the younger people, not to intermix more. I mean, I think they should both, I agree with you 100%, that they should both be more open to uh, getting together and sharing the information because that's what's going to grow the art and that's what's going to continue the art. Uh, it is a frustrating thing when I see that. I always try and make sure that I do involve younger people uh, when I meet them or, you know, talk to them and at least open the door so they're available, you know, to, to talk to them. Because I learned from yeah, them as much as they learned from me, frankly. Yeah, 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 completely. And I think the thing is that somehow I don't understand why. I think there might be a misconception that youngsters, they're, they're a bit more uh habituated with modern magic right this visual idea of right. color changes and switches and slides whereas the older generation might be more focused towards tricks right, right. so i think one misconception that even i had was that if you hang out with somebody that's over let's say 50 they're not gonna do a lot of slides so i'm hanging out with with young we young people and most of the time they're just doing tricks, which is fun, right? right? But for me, it was a thing where I went and I hanged out. One thing that I put myself through is I want to sit down next to people that are much older than me and we just jam. And I've been surprised so many times that the thing that uh, people that are older than me jam with is switches, changes, palms, and sure. I'm sitting there looking and I'm like, man, you have a perfect palm for right. palming. Because when you're, when you're young, your palm is very slim. Right. And when you get over 40 and 50, your palm's like amazing for all of the slides. It's perfect. Right. So I think the mixing uh, is definitely has been, uh, uh, how, how do you put it? Has been handicapped by social media. Yeah, I agree. People I agree. Are yeah, much more scared yeah. to talk with one another. Yeah, and it's a lot of it. Or uh, if I'm not, I'm not sure if you were in magic at the time when cardistry first really started to become a thing, but a lot of magicians, older magicians, and my generation, frankly, at the time, were like, "Oh, those kids are just jugglers," and you know, blah blah blah. But and that's yeah, not yeah. true. And I knew a couple of cardistry guy kids in the uh, area that used to come to the magic shop I would hang out at, and uh, they were good kids. And they, they sure they were interested in cardistry, but I thought a lot, a lot of it looked great when they would do it for me, and it looked magical to me. It may not be magic in the pure sense of the word, but it surely was magical when people would see it and people would react to it. And a lot of them were did well, have yeah. still had an interest in magic. So we exchanged ideas and thoughts with each other as well. I mean, and you just. You can't, uh, I agree with you 100%, again, on both sides. You can't, a lot of guys my age just, uh, for, for whatever reason, just think that younger guys have nothing to offer. And it's a huge mistake on their part, in my opinion. 
and uh, vice versa. I mean, like you said, you put yourself through it. I think, I think we all need to meet, make the effort more uh, uh, when we do have the opportunity to be in person to spend time together and see. And part of it is what you said. It's not only learning tricks and exchanging moves, but just chatting and talking to each other and, you know, uh, find out where they're coming from and what their interests are and, you know, uh, offer their opinions on things. And it'll, it might open both eyes to different things, to viewing things differently. And I think that's hugely really important, agree. hugely important in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, it feels like a natural way to segue into jamming with magicians. How do you jam with uh, other magicians? Yeah, so it's interesting. I found uh, I recently retired uh, about two or three years ago, and uh, so I have more time. So we've spent more time uh, act when things got better after the pandemic, meeting with magicians. And uh, for the most uh, most part, depending on the environment, if you're just meeting somewhere to meet up, like somebody's coming through town and you want to meet up, I find that uh, most of the time you just kind of uh, meet up, usually at a restaurant or somewhere where you can get coffee or a drink or a dinner or lunch. And the first uh, half hour to 45 minutes or so, if it's somebody you don't know, seems to be more just kind of chat. For me, it's better to just kind of chat, get yeah. to know the person a little bit and the interest. And then it seems like yeah. you'll start talking about uh, magic. You'll be talking about some of your favorite tricks and the tricks that you do and um, then start uh, performing some stuff for each other. And uh, it seems to kind of segue into that. So it usually starts more as a social thing. And now if you're at a convention, it's a little bit different because people there are a lot of times to yeah. exchange tricks and do stuff. So um, I'll find that a lot of times there, you'll find that uh, people uh, will, uh, you'll specifically be probably want to meet some people that you know are going to be there. So uh, I find that if yeah. uh, I approach people that I might not know or that I know, uh, that are sitting like in a, you don't want to interrupt them when they're in the middle of a conversation with somebody, but if they're just kind of hanging no, out, no. yeah. And if they're just kind of hanging out doing it and, uh, you know, be ready to perform something for somebody if they're interested, you know, to see it kind of, so they get an idea of who you are, you know, what kind of magic you like, what kind of things you do. But, um, I wouldn't hesitate to approach them just like, uh, I said, and you agreed, just, you know, you want to do the normal social thing. So if they're talking to somebody or they're in the middle of eating a meal or whatever, you don't want to interrupt them, but certainly yeah. approach them. I mean, the, the, the worst that's going to happen is they're going to say they're busy or they have to go somewhere, but uh, just approach them and sure. see. And a lot of, you'll find a lot of people are much more open to uh, sessioning and spending times, particularly in that environment. That's kind of what they're looking for. So just to try and get over that fear of approaching people and people that you might think are, Oh, you know, this guy is a magic legend or, you know, um, that that's true, but they're just people too, for the most part. So they're going to be as happy to meet you most times as you are to meet them. Very well put, very well put, man. Yeah. Very well put. And, uh, I think many times it's, it's just the fact that when you're young, older people really intimidate you. You know, right. just, just, I know how I've been intimidated by them, but it's so interesting. It's one thing, what idea you have of that person and how you think the interaction is going to go. Every time I sat down next to somebody and I interacted with them, it was the most pleasant. It was yes. so friendly and you're like, wow, like literally 30 seconds ago, I thought <laughs> this was going to go very bad. <laughs> Right. This guy is so friendly. Right. Yeah. Part of that is, uh, um, uh, I agree a hundred percent, first of all. And part of it is how you approach it. Because, uh, if you're not a jerk when you approach somebody and I'm not saying you would be, because when I met you, you're a very, uh, pleasant person. You've got a very outgoing personality. So it's easy to warm up to you pretty quickly, exactly. but, uh, it's, it's important to approach them with that attitude of, you know, not, not, and not, uh, and you're not, not for some to be cocky and arrogant when you approach these people, but just be friendly no. and normally, you know, socially friendly and be open to what you just said, open to that, you know, and I know it's hard to get over this because I have this, the same thing to this day when I meet people if I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, try and get over that anxiety of, well, this is not going to go well and, and, you know, try and shift the mindset to, well, this is probably, you know, hey, this will go well or, you know, what's the, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? You know, they're going to. Yeah. Be what busy and walk happen? away. But you're right. That's the hardest thing to overcome to this day for me, too, if it's somebody I haven't met before. And uh, once you start, uh, you'll, you'll probably find this because you've started to release a few things and you're doing a lot of the uh, social media stuff for uh, big blind media. But once you um, 
meet, you'll be surprised at how many people will know you or know more. I'm always surprised when somebody recognizes me or know who I am through through magic, no matter who they are, because uh, you just don't think that they would, or you, I, I don't at least. Exactly. Know, uh, you know, yeah. I'm somebody. And all of a sudden they'll say, oh yeah. Or the other thing is when you've released material, which you have too now, and when somebody will approach you and say, um, yeah, I do your trick uh, all the time, or I you know, got this great tip from your video, or thanks for that. Uh, and that always... Yeah. Uh, uh, surprises me but always pleases me and uh because uh, you never know once you lob the stuff out there you never know if anybody even sees it but it's always nice to get uh, feedback like that too you know that people appreciate what you do because frankly that's why i do it it's never been about the money for me it's always been i just enjoy magic and i enjoy sharing some of the stuff that i have do you still remember the first tr trick that you created and um really thought you went like Oh, wow, I really think this is good. Yeah, so I didn't create a lot of magic when I was younger. So when I first started magic, I did, believe it or not, mostly stand-up, illusions, and stage show stuff. I did very little close-up. But at the time, and I'm going back 40 years now, at the time, close-up was... Right? Pardon? You were 10. You were 12. Yeah, I was. Oh. Yeah, I was 10, so it's 53 years ago. And then... Um, when I uh, started to perform more, uh, you know, five or so years after that, it was mostly stand-up. But close-up magic wasn't a thing like it is now as much. I mean, people did do close-up, and it was somewhat of a thing, but it wasn't like it is now. The market's changed both in performance and in uh, what sells for the market. And there wasn't as much uh, close-up. People did not perform close-up as much. So what you ended up doing is what I did, and a lot of people in my generation is performing a lot of different types of magic. You would do close-up, uh, some, but you would do stage magic. I did illusions. We still have illusions somewhere. I don't know where they're at now. Uh, but you would do, you'd perform like kind of what you got hired for. So you became more of a general practitioner. You would do a, you'd do a good job with each of them, but your knowledge base would be wider because of that. So long answer to your question was early on, I wasn't correcting tricks, creating as many tricks as really variations of tricks or presentations for tricks that were out there and available. So that was the big thing that I did early on uh, in my career really was, was more of creating, um, not from whole cloth tricks, but variations of tricks or uh, yeah. just, uh, you know, uh, routining, like fun routines that you'd come up with and ideas. Do you still remember how you got those gigs when you started? Because I know you've been on cruise ships, you've yeah. performed magic in Hawaii. I have. Uh, a lot of it, so this is funny because I, I, I've been to do a lecture for a local club and one of the questions I get from a lot of people is, um, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of, like I've done a couple of Penguin Live lectures, I've done the releases with Penguin, I've done releases with uh, Big Blind, you know, I performed, like you said, in those different environments, I've lectured a lot of different places, I've been asked to lecture places, and a lot of uh, my magician friends ask that exact same question, like how did you get those things? And I, I always tell them, uh, this is going to sound like a cop-up, but it's absolutely true. I always tell them that uh, I'm the last guy to ask because I never set out to have any of that. So a lot of the shows I got, frankly, the, the, how I started doing a lot of shows locally was when I was in high school, I, read a, um, uh, I had to do a book report. I was either junior or senior in high school, and I hadn't read a book. We had tracking of classes. So this was like a superior English class. Okay. So they didn't like assign stuff as much as you just got to, they would say like read a book and do a report on it, but you would be able to choose it. Uh, I hadn't read a book because I was lazy in school, but I hadn't read a book. But uh, uh, I, so when it came around, he said, what book did you read? I said, the illustrated history of magic, which is a book that I had read, but it was not like, I didn't read it to a book report. And the yeah, teacher yeah, yeah. said, you can either do a little show for the class or you can write a book report. Well, I'm not an idiot. I did the show for the class. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the kids in the class happened to be, yeah, one of the kids in the class happened to be a, on the school newspaper. So he wrote an article in the school newspaper, which then was picked up by a local newspaper. So once wow. that, kind of, yeah, I mean, it was just a fluke. So once that happened, I started to get calls for shows. And then just, it, so most of my shows were booked through word of mouth. Uh, when I, I, I got booked for a while through Magic Incorporated, the magic shop, they would get calls for um, yep. shows, and then they would start booking me for shows. They just ask, hey, would you be interested in being one of our performers too? And uh, uh, so then that kind of happened, and then I would get repeat bookings or people would recommend me. So I never did a big push for publicity. 
uh, I just would get um, word of mouth was mostly how I got uh, shows. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Back in the day. Yeah, yeah that exactly. Was, that yeah. Was there was no internet, so there was no, you know, people wouldn't look you up on the web or whatever. When they, you know, there was yeah. the yellow pages in the old, uh, when people used to get actually hard copy phone books, which I don't even think they do anymore. Uh, but it was mostly yeah. people at that time would be recommending people to other people was how you get, I got a lot of the shows and it's kind of grew from there. So. Um, you did tell me, I'm going to segue a little bit, might feel uh, like we're sidetracking, but no problem. not not really from my point of view. You told me that your mentors, some of your mentors were Jim Ryan, Jay Marshall, yes. yep. Billy Bishop. Yep. So how did these people start? Like, how did the mentoring happen? How did you learn Great from question. them? Great question. That's a wonderful question, actually. It's a terrific question. Um, so it happened through Jay Marshall owned the magic shop when it was um, when I started going in, I was a kid when I was like 10 years old and we start going there. Yeah. So I just he became a kind of a fixture in magic in the area. He was actually um, uh, he died in 19 or in 2005. So a lot of people don't know him now, but he was the dean of the Society of American Magicians before he passed away. And he had performed literally all over the world, London Palladium, Whoa. really uh, like revered and respected magician, Jay Marshall. Um, so, um, which I didn't know when I first started going into the magic shop, I just thought he was the old guy who owned the magic shop, which was funny to think back on it. Exactly. But, uh, I would, I would be there a lot and kind of talk to him and hang out. And then, um, so you, you'd be kind of, come kind of friendly through that. And then he would see that I was a little bit more serious about it. It wasn't just a, you know, a passing thing. So, um, we would, yeah, uh, yeah we would just kind of ch like chat and talk and, um, uh, so and then one time when we were a friend and I were doing a series of illusion shows for a local zoo at the holiday time, uh, I had asked him if he would come to the show and look at it and offer some advice. And he did. I mean, he he not only came to the show, he brought a friend of his, another guy, uh, Tommy Edwards, who was um, a oh. popular Chicago magic guy and uh, was a, sort of a mentor to me as well. They came to the show and then they took us out to lunch like a day or two later and had a whole list of stuff like different things to go over Whoa. with us. Yeah, they took very it very nice. seriously. Offered us some wonderful advice. I mean, you know, in a very, very constructive way. It wasn't all positive, trust me, but it was in a very constructive oh, way that they did it. Yeah, and so Jay, I just kind of knew through that. And then I, when I was working on stuff, I would come up to the shop or we, we would go out to lunch the last part of his life, we would, we would go out to dinner every Saturday night for for years. We would go. I would uh, come to the shop late in the day, and uh, we would go to dinner, and then with the, usually a couple other magicians, and then his wife, who was also well known a magic Fran Marshall, uh, was in a nursing home near where the shop and where he lived and where we would have dinner. So we would go to dinner, and they would ask me to take her over there so he could visit her before visiting hours were over, and I'd drop him off. So we did that every Saturday for years. We ended up traveling a wow. couple of times together, different things too. So that's kind of how it happened. With Jim Ryan, he was a member of a magic club that I belonged to, and I knew who he was, and I had seen him perform. Now he was in his 80s when I met him, but he still was very proficient at performing. Um, was a again a world renowned close up performer. He was actually asked to be the house magician at the Magic Castle uh, early on when they opened. He went out there and performed. Wow. I asked him, and he turned it down because he had eight kids and a bunch of grandchildren in Chicago area. He didn't want to leave the area. Uh, but he, what happened with Jim was he had put out a, a series of small booklets of some of his magic. So uh, I learned one of his tricks and I asked if I could show it to him. And I showed it to him at one of the magic club meetings. And uh, he thought it was great that somebody was learning the magic and did it. And he offered me a couple of pointers and I came back like a week or two later and did it for him again, adding some of the stuff he had suggested. And he thought that was great that I did it and followed up. So then he asked me if I wanted to come yeah. by his place and we could uh, session a little bit. And that's how that developed from there. And then uh, I would go over there every so often and uh, we would travel to magic conventions. I would drive him and his wife, who uh, Kitty, Ryan, lovely, lovely lady, too. Uh, so um, that's how that developed with Jim. Uh, we would go to magic club meetings. I would drive them. I'd go over there and spend some time with them. Wow. And, yeah, he took me to Fector's. I went to uh, Fector's convention in 1985. He wanted to go and was his health wasn't great even at the time. So he had asked Obi O'Brien, who ran Fector's, if I could come with so Jim could go. So 
Uh, so that's and then he would introduce me to other magicians as did Jay Marshall. They would also introduce me to other magicians, which opened up doors to other opportunities. So lo, sorry for the long answer, but that's how that developed. No, no, not at all. What was the age difference between you guys? So Jay and Marshall and I used to laugh because it was um, he was born in August. I was born in August. And I want to say it, it was like. I think he turned 80 when I turned 40. So it was like a 40 year age difference in us. And Jim Ryan was even greater because I knew Jim when he was in his 80s. He died, he was 90 when he passed away in 1999, 1990. Whoa. And I would have been um, uh, 41. So yeah. it was like a 50 year age difference with Jim. Wow. So, uh, yeah. I asked but, uh, this because can you imagine that? I think, I think mentorships like this have died out a little bit in modern days because of the agree. internet. I agree. Because you don't need quotation marks, a mentor anymore because you have the internet, which is like such a, such a bad replacement for an actual mentor. Absolutely. And, and uh, I'm just marveling at the, the fact that, you know, there's such a big age difference and so many doors opened. So many, yeah, I mean, had, that's, Probably absolutely. Memories. The, absolutely. I mean, I met uh, David Ben, the Canadian magician. I met through Jay. Uh, they were David Ben had come to Chicago to meet with Jay to ask him about some stuff when he was putting one of his shows together called The Conjurer, and um, we all went out to dinner. And it was David Ben and a couple other people from Canada. Uh, long stories about those people, but I won't mention them now. But uh, then okay. uh, Jay wanted to go. Uh, then David invited us up to Canada to go see a show in Toronto. So through that, I met David Ben. I met uh, Alan Slate, who was a big name in magic at the time at a party. Wow. I met uh, some other people through that, such so, uh, Julie Ang and uh, a guy uh, who does a filmmaker, Daniel Zuckerbrot, who made the film on Die Vernon, a couple other films. And I know those wow. and I'm friendly with those. Yeah, and I'm friendly with those people to this day. And that was because I had met them through Jay and with Jay. Yeah. So that's the other important part about mentors is uh, exactly the point you said earlier, not only can you learn a lot of valuable information from them, not only on performing, but on a lot of things. And in addition to that, you know, yeah. you know the uh, relationships you can build with people that they know too. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. So, yeah. So have you been on the giving side? You've been on the receiving side. You've had oh, mentors. Absolutely. Have you yeah. Been yeah, definitely. So a friend of mine and I, I've talked about this a lot. And in my first Penguin Live lecture, I, uh, I in the middle of the lecture, I talked about it. So um, uh, there's a it's it's real important to me that we that we do give back and mentor other people. So there's a there's a handful of people that I know that uh, have been very uh, that I've uh, yeah, would consider oh. like students or people I work with. They're not, you know, yeah. we, uh, and um, over the years and. Uh, uh, I think it's very, I've always tried to reach out to people that are, um, you have a true interest in magic and ask and see it to actually help and do that. And then introduce the same thing, introduce them to people and all that kind of thing. I know a big thing I try and do at conventions is if there's, I'm hanging out with people I know, like, you know, uh, uh, like you saw kind of when we were in Blackpool, like John Ban and I would be together and then somebody else might come by and we'd be, I'll be talking. And if there's a young guy that you can see wants to say hello or is interested or whatever on the outskirts, even if it's somebody I don't know, I'll invite him to say, oh, you know, I'll invite him to join the group at least and to participate or see because I know that exactly what you talked about earlier, they may just be too nervous to make that, you know, yeah first step in so i'll say oh you know did you want to you know, say you know whatever try and draw them in but uh so i do that generally but absolutely locally there's a handful the one guy is the, the uh, kid i mentioned that we get together all the time you know to this day and uh, uh we'll spend time together and it's it's important to me that that continues and i enjoy doing it because it's an opportunity to pass on the information i'm able to pass on things that i learned from my mentors and through them, yeah. and then I'm hoping to encourage them to do the same thing. So as they age and get older, that they would offer the same thing to younger magicians and mentors. So at least 
there's some semblance of that tie continuing, you know, and people get to experience that. And there's some that are appreciative of it and, you know, uh, will continue. And there's some that aren't or there's some that move on to something else. Or there's some that exactly. once you start getting involved in, you realize that there's only, you know, they only want one thing. They either want, you know, some contact information from you or whatever. And, yeah. you know, so you just kind of cut those ties. But for the most part, yes, absolutely, I try and continue that. Uh, it's very important to me to continue that uh, to this nice. day, which is why I hung out at the magic shop. Uh, he recently, great magic shop in Chicago was Midwest Magic, where the owner unfortunately had to recently close due to circumstances well beyond his control. And that one of the reasons I kept going into the shop and doing that was because of that, because you want to encourage the, the new people walking through the door. You know, yeah. I think it's real important. That's very nice. Yeah. Uh, I like what you said at uh, one point uh, in your answer uh, regarding uh, inviting somebody in. Maybe they're a bit too nervous. Yeah, and absolutely. I want to ask you, do you do you remember yourself when you were younger and you wanted to approach magicians? Like, did you fail? Did you... <laughs> how yeah. were you feeling? How did you feel at that point? Do you still yeah, remember? So I, I would say nine out of ten times I would fail. <laughs> Because you would get up to the point where you want to do it, and then I would either just like back off, or I'd be hesitant, or I wouldn't do it. Um, but I did do remember. Do you still remember why you, why you would show them? Uh, so I'm trying to remember. Um, it's a good question. I have to think a little bit about that. In Jim Ryan's case, I learned. Have uh, I learned Did one of his tricks. Have a so, prepared? I, I sometimes I would, sometimes I wouldn't. I would either try and have a trick prepared that was either a trick of theirs or one that I knew was something they were interested in, or um, one of the one of my early tricks, uh, close up tricks that I developed was uh, 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 in the hands handling of wild card, which is we recorded, which is going to be one of the releases uh, through Big Blind, and so that became my go to trick. Because uh, I actually developed that originally like 40 years ago, believe it or not, and uh, refined it over the years. But uh, that was kind of my go-to trick to show other magicians would be the handling for the In the Hands wild card. Because they would know the effect and they would know some of the stuff that was happening. But it was it's just a good, solid trick. And it would show that, you know, I thought about it to do it so I could do a walk around rather than to do the usual layout. It looked cool. a little different than the routine. So that was my go-to routine trick for a lot of years to, uh, to introduce myself to other magicians would be the wild card, the in the hands wild card. So if you would make some advice for somebody that's, you know, just starting out and they've been doing magic for like a year, let's say, and they're very nervous about performing for other magicians, what would be your advice? Well, like one thing that you did say was, you know, just have like a trick that you've been working on and that you're very confident with. Like that's one thing that I picked up. Absolutely. Uh, that's, well, what, that's, what else would you advise younger magicians, you know, that are struggling to perform for other people? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things I would say is uh, that is absolutely true. A trick that you're uh, pretty confident that you can do well, that you've done a lot. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to, uh, so don't worry about impressing them or fooling them, I should say. Don't worry about fooling them. Uh, if you have a trick that'll fool them, great, but uh, they're not, they're probably not going to be fooled. And to be honest with you, most magicians are, even if they are fooled, a lot of magicians are going to pretend like they're not fooled by the trick because they don't yes. want to be fooled. <laughs> so, so don't worry about fooling them. Don't think, well, this trick will fool them. Uh, do a trick that you think you do well. Uh, when you finish the trick, for you, when you do, when you, uh, you're going to be nervous. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I remember early on that I would literally, my hands would literally shake when I would start into a trick for an, a, you know, a magician yeah. that I thought was really somebody. So uh, that's going to happen. So be, know that you're going to be nervous. Know that you're probably going to screw up once in a while and don't let it kill you. It's not the end of the world if you do. Sure. Um, uh, do uh, uh, the other one is to, to, to quote from Nike, just do it. I mean, you know, at some point you just got to, well, you know, just do it uh, because, uh, you know, all of those things are going to happen. You're going to do. And then when you finish, uh, two, don't expect like a standing ovation from these guys, because most magicians, as you know, are going to react to a trick by just going, ah, uh-huh, uh-huh. 
you know, yep. uh, but uh, and don't expect to fool them, like I said, even if you do. But then say, hey, and do you have any advice to offer from the, you know, with a trick too? Because then it kind of puts them on them and they're going to go, oh, okay, you know, this isn't, this guy isn't just trying to show off to me or be Mr. Big Shot. I mean, he's, you know, interested in improving. So, you know, say, hey, I, you know, this is one of my favorite tricks to do. If you don't mind, could I show it to you and then do it? And then when you do it, say, you know, I just wondering, you know, could you offer any advice on this or whatever? And that kind of opens the door too. And that actually would, could start the conversation. Because if you just do the trick and then walk away or just do the trick and wait for them to say something, they may not. But if you say, you know, you know, and I, I know I need some work on this or, you know, could you offer any tips or advice? That's going to start a True. whole conversation that may never have happened. True. It, it definitely would not have happened. Yeah. I don't know how it is in the, in the States, but if you perform a trick for somebody in Eastern Europe, yeah, it's usually exactly the opposite of everything you say. The really? first thing that people are, <laughs> the first thing that you're going to hear is, I think the trick is very nice, but did you think about doing it this way instead? Oh, really? Or what about changing the ending? And it's unsolicited advice that many <laughs> Eastern Europeans are famous for, are yeah. well known for, like a stereotype. Yeah. And then you get, you can get very defensive in a way because you're like, I, sure. I, I, I don't want, I don't want any advice. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> So and there are there are some a, there are a lot of performers that perform uh, a trick. For, well, that's what uh, I I joke with John Bannon about this a little bit too, and and that sounds like name driving, but it's not just because we were joking about it. But when um, people will show you a trick, you can tell early on when they finish. If they do, first of all, if they don't ask you for uh, advice, I won't offer the advice because then they're probably not looking for it. They're just looking for you to say, "Well, that's the greatest thing I ever true. saw," you know. <laughs> you know and uh and you have to uh, realize if they do ask for advice and it is really like a bad variation or just a bad trick uh and i can't think of a good example off the top of my head but you have to just no. you have to figure out a way to say it without like you don't want to crush anybody no matter how bad the trick is so you know you, you just have to figure out a nice way of saying well you know uh, you don't want to say, well, that trick stinks, but you know, you want to uh, find wow. a nice way to say it. But, but a lot of times I find on the, the flip side, it's, it's funny with these Europeans offer the unsolicited advice because that's not as often here. But what's funny is a lot of the performers here you find are not looking for an opinion or advice. They're, they literally are just looking for you to say, well, that's wonderful. Well, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, we're just after so much performing for a lay audience. I suppose you want validation from people in your branch. Sure, absolutely. And I understand that completely. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. We, we talked about how it is like to be performing for magicians. But I'm very curious, how did you overcome your fear when you started doing magic? I mean, you were so young and all of these shows came out of nowhere. Did you not feel fear? Or if you did, what were some of the habits that you had or the thoughts that you went through in order to just keep pushing? Yeah, that's a good question. When I think back about it, and this is going to sound probably more arrogant than it's intended, but I did not have a lot of fear when I uh, started performing, believe it or not. Uh, Very I, nice. I, yeah, I probably should have because I, I think about some of the stuff I performed back then. Now, fortunately, video was there. I mean, you didn't even have like video. When I was that age, there were video cameras didn't even exist, like consumer video cameras, and um, there oh. certainly wasn't cell, there wasn't cell phones didn't even exist. So to my no. benefit, there's not a lot of video footage out from earlier because I'd probably <laughs> you know <laughs> want to burn it all. Uh, but um, uh, I I for whatever reason I didn't have a huge fear of performing in most environments uh, when I started to perform i again i probably should have had more than i did but i didn't but i would have some and uh i found the advice that i offered other uh, people like that is i you you find an opening trick i would find an opening trick that i would do uh that would uh, i did some warm-up stuff for family audiences like some of the old gag warm-up stuff and uh then uh, the first trick and you could kind of get a feel for your audience I would always suggest you structure your audience. So in the first few minutes, you get a feel for what the audience 
uh, is like and what they're going to react to. So I would have a couple of different gags or bits I might do in the beginning, and depending on which ones they would react to or how they would react, or if they wouldn't react at all, or if they wouldn't become involved at all, then you know that that's the type of audience you're going to have. And knowing that, would now you weren't always 100% right because that might change throughout the performance, but at least you kind of gave you an idea of, of how you were starting and where you were starting from. And that seemed to make to relax me a little bit. I would try and open with a couple of bits rather than a trick to give them a chance to settle in to get to know who I am and so, so I could get to know a little bit about them. And it would also try and be so they get an idea of what the show is. Because a lot of times when you're hired to perform for a group, they just know you're a magician, but they have no idea what type of magician or who you are. And so I would always try and take the first few minutes of the show at least for them to get an idea of who I was and kind of what the show would be about, what to expect from me. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful advice, though. I love well, thanks. that. Thank you, man. I'm actually going to do that. As well. Yeah, no, it's, it's really important to do that. I mean, it, to me it is because it settled my nerves and I think it makes them more comfortable with you at the same time. True, true. You know? Yeah. So we talked about performing for magicians, for lay audiences, and performing implies learning. Yes. So how did you go about learning magic throughout the years? And towards the end... Tell me how that has changed as you kept getting older. Oh, that's a great question, too. Um, so a lot of my uh, early on learning was uh, books because that's what was available. Uh, there were more better um, books, uh, general public books written. A book uh, written back when I was probably about 10 or 12 called Magic Digest is a great book. If you can find used copies of that somewhere, a great general magic book. Uh, the Mark Wilson Course in Magic came out a little bit after when I had already started in Magic, but I picked up a copy of that. So most of, most of my learning was done by book learning. And then when I was younger, before I could drive, uh, once a year, uh, my dad would take me to the Magic Shop, to Magic Incorporated. So I would buy some tricks through Magic Incorporated. So, But it was mostly through books. Uh, I didn't know any other magicians really at the time until I was probably in my teens in the area. There wasn't. I didn't belong to any magic groups until about then either. So a lot of my learning early on was strictly through books and uh, trial and error. Uh, and some of the earlier books, my brother was a little bit interested, my older brother for a while, but then he kind of lost interest uh, pretty early on. But I mean, I would, I would build some of the stuff that you would find in the magic books that were more uh, stagey uh, props like production boxes and vanishes. I would literally oh. try and build out of car like cardboard because uh, I didn't do woodworking and try and do that. So, but mostly books is how I learned. And then uh, when I got a little bit older and met some other magicians, it was through exchanging ideas and tricks with magicians, going to the magic shop, yeah. hang out at the magic shop. Uh, but it was still the the uh, media still was mostly through books. And then you begin to learn a little bit more through. Um, uh, performing so you would learn kind of the direction of things should go or what should happen through performing so you would learn uh, quite a bit through performing as well so and performing for lay people if you perform strictly for magicians you're gonna you're creating a weird little strange world for yourself because what works yeah. and when you perform for magicians isn't necessarily even close to what will work when you perform for real people so if you do and sure. and frankly it's it's different when you perform for people outside your family because your family already knows who you are. Uh, so it's the reactions are going to be a lot different than you're going to get from people who don't know you when you perform for uh, in public. Uh, so a lot of my uh, learning then was from um, experience and then from other performers who you begin you, when you get a circle of performers around you that you trust that won't just pat you on the back uh, and aren't looking to snipe you because they want to take you all your shows. <laughs> When you get a good trusted group of performers, they'll offer good feedback for you too, and recommendations, uh, like uh, uh, you know what books to get and what to, what to learn and where to go next. Um, so that's really uh, you know, and that's that's the bulk of my learning is still basically done that way. I do look at downloads and videos today because it's where a lot of stuff's released. Uh, but cool. um, that that's basically how I got started and how I learned. So you learn you learn something from a book. How do you practice? How did you practice over the years? Yeah, I would, uh, you'd learn it from the book. You would walk through it. And 
remember that a lot of early magic books are really poorly written too by the way i mean they weren't the greatest yeah. particularly like the little booklets and pamphlets that came out that were more uh they, they weren't self-published because it wasn't self-publishing but magic inc had a whole line of books and booklets that were published and a lot of them were pretty well mm -hmm. written but a lot of them were not that well written and early magic writers were not as good even the popular early magic writers so uh, it would literally be working through the trick. So by rehearsing, it'd be you'd have the book open, you would work through the trick, you would learn it. And then I would try and uh, run through it as many times as I possibly could. So then the muscle memory would set in so I didn't have to worry about whatever moves might need to be done. And when it was the bigger stuff, like stage stuff, I would literally work through like blocking a little bit, like where I would stand, where I would move like how I would lift up the prop, how I would put it down. Do I need a table to put something on? Could I do it without a table? Is another prop going to be in the way? So you would just work through it. I would literally w walk through things that way. And then I do. I would do another uh, thing that I would do a lot is as I was reading and I was interested in a trick and how it was, this is going to sound a little bit odd, uh, but um, I would Go I literally it. would like visualize in my mind what it would look like and how I would present it. I, I, I swear that's true. I mean, it sounds nutty. Uh, and a lot no, of times, and a lot of times what we had come up with in your mind wouldn't necessarily translate through, but a lot of that is how it would happen. And I, I would, I would just kind of think to myself in my mind, like, okay, so, you know, I could do this, maybe I'd move this way if I do that. Oh, and I could do this and think it through and then work it out after thinking it through. So, uh, uh, that I, I would spend to this day, that's how I do a lot of the, um, if I see a trick I like or come up with an idea I like, I'll try and think it through in my head before I, a lot of times before I actually pick up the props and start to work on the trick itself. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. Because the, a lot of it actually does happen in our minds anyway. It does. You know? so it does. If you can and manage it, it makes to... You, and it go makes on, you... On. And I find... Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but... Uh, and I no. find it makes it makes me think it through a little bit more than I would if I would just start playing with the props right away. Uh, so it just um, th for me that's the advantage is to do that for me. So you can also so much faster make modifications in your mind than Absolutely. actually doing it. Absolutely agree. And it helps uh, a lot. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about briefly, just about is kind of was around this subject too, is um, one of the things I want to make sure we, we covered and capture is in particularly in creating magic and learning magic cool. is you want to make sure that you have a good uh, base of knowledge. Uh, what made me think of is when I said friends would recommend stuff. So if um, I would learn some tricks that I might never do, I'd learn some moves maybe. I, I wasn't, I was never a move person where I would move, learn moves for a move's sake. But I think it's important to be well read in all aspects of magic. So even if you're a close up performer, you should look at the stand up material that's published. You should look at it, even stage illusions, uh, how they work, maybe how watch how they're performed from people, because a lot of that can translate into the work that you're doing, no matter which of the genres of magic you work. Plus, it gives you a larger base of knowledge. So you may be working on a close-up trick, but there may be a way that a manipulator handles a ball or, you know, a playing sure. cards or whatever that you can apply to your close-up work. So make sure you have, don't stop, never stop learning. Make sure that your base of knowledge, your base of knowledge is what you draw from when you create and when you're putting together sure. routines. It's just, I mean, it's, it's literally like getting the, grabbing the right tool or the right thing for the right moment. So if I'm working on a card routine and I want, I need to switch this card for that card, or I want this to be that, uh, there may be something that I remember from years ago that I read that, or learned that it was not for wow. that, that you can apply to that trick or a principle that you can use. Uh, so the principle that's used in, the oil and water for the ending, if you think about it, is really the principle of, uh, you know, hiding that you, you use in illusions where it's hiding, uh, hiding the secret right in front of everybody. You, you don't hide. I mean, the secret is right there in front of everybody, but they don't see it. And there, there's a reason why they don't see it. And the reason they don't see it is because of things that I learned in performing stage magic and illusions that I apply to uh, close up magic. 
So uh, it's important to have that large base of knowledge that you can draw from. So when you're creating routines or tricks or performances or even shows, you've got that background that you can pull from and you're not limiting yourself in what you can do or how things will turn out. I think if people can find, especially younger performers, if they can find opportunities just like you did to perform in different scenarios, I think that would really, really evolve them. Uh, maybe not everybody needs to go on cruise ships or right, right, no, exactly. Magic, right. But you can still do the things that nowadays are new. For example, if you're not doing so, uh, uh, social media magic, try and do social media magic for a while. See how what that is going to teach you. Absolutely. I have a, a, one of my friends is a great live performer. I mean, he kills it. But yeah. if he has to perform in front of a camera, he looks like a, like a complete newbie. Because right, it's right. so different when you're performing for something that doesn't move and Absolutely. only looks at you. Absolutely. So, I, I couldn't agree um, more. I, but, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, everybody listening to Tom, don't take everything like word by word. You, know, like don't, you don't have to do what he did, but use the things that are happening right now, basically. Abs to... Absolutely. The, the opportunities, that, those were just the opportunities that uh, uh, approach that I had. Uh, not everybody will have the same ones and they've changed dramatically, like no. you said, over the years. Comedy clubs were a huge thing when I was in my 20s. They're not, they're not nowhere near what they were back, you know, in the day. No. So, but you're Definitely. absolutely right. And the other thing I want to stress is what you said too is, and don't discount something. People will say, well, social media, uh, magic is crap. No, it's not. And there's going to be a time when you may need to do that because it ain't going away. Yeah. I got news for you. So, yeah. and it's really performing in front of a camera. So there's, you know, you, I, I couldn't agree more. You should absolutely take time to perform in those different uh, uh, opportunities that are today. That's exactly what they should take from this is what you just said. You know, take the opportunity to perform in the situations where you'll have the advantage, you know, opportunity to perform today. It's going to make you a better performer overall. So, guys, uh, we're going to be learning the trick that Tom has prepared. So get your decks out and um, we're going to cut to him and he's going to go through the entire thing. And then we're going to come back here and continue the interview. Uh, thanks, Biz. The trick I'm about to show and explain actually is not... Uh, one of my tricks it comes from my mentor jim ryan but since we were talking a lot about learning magic and mentors and that kind of thing i thought it'd be a great one to teach here so let me lower this a little bit so you can see uh the uh pad and the cards a little bit uh better perfect now um trick's pretty simple what i'm gonna do is um just thumb up the side and you tell me to stop at any point and they would say stop you say great that's the card uh, that'll be uh, your card and we'll see what card you selected the four of spades uh, we're going to place the card back uh, so as i thumb up the side again say stop and wherever they do you lift up the cards have them place their card back and there you go the card is lost somewhere in the uh, pack of cards now um i'm not going to find your card i'm going to use the cards to help me find your card um well you'll see what that means in a minute if i give the deck a little bit of a cut the first card i cut to is going to tell me whether your card is a high value card or a low value card and the card i i cut to is Ooh, the ace of spades that's not very helpful because the ace can either be high or low depending on the card game you're playing and um, what you want the value to be so uh, that's not real helpful now the second card is going to tell me the suit of your card and that one is always correct it tells me the suit of the card is a spade so your card is in fact a spade is that uh, correct and of course i'll agree with you that it is now the next card is going to tell me exactly where your card is in the pack from this spot where we cut to and the card is a three. So that tells me your card is exactly three cards down from right here. So that's one, that's two, and here is three. So for the first time, what's the name of your card? And they'll tell you it is the four of spades. You say, right. Oh, these here? No, see, these are the four aces. You see, I'm well on the way to the luckiest night of my life. All right, so that's the trick. It's uh, Jim Ryan's handling of the classic Dunbury Delusion. Uh, there is a little bit of setup that needs to be done. You start with one of the aces, and I put the ace of spades on top of the deck. And on the bottom of the deck are the other three aces and a three, any three. Um, so I put the ace of hearts, then the three, 
than the other two aces. So just from the bottom up, you want two aces, any three, and the other ace. So that's on the bottom of your deck, and on top of the deck is the ace of spades. Um, to do the trick, you just thumb up the side, where they say stop, you stop, you toss out the card, you slap this packet on top, that'll be important in a few minutes, you'll see why, and you tell them, go ahead, take a look at the card, show it around, and they will, in this case, it's the two of clubs, you say we're going to place the card back, you thumb up the side, now you're going to do a bluff pass, um, with a couple of finesses from Jim, so as you thumb up the side, they say stop, you reach over, and you just lift off the top card, they think, or should think, that you're lifting off all of these cards uh, that you thumb, but you're only lifting off the top card, and uh, you uh, instead of all the cards so you thumb up the side you just lift up the top card so you see i've only got the ace you say go ahead place your card back but you see how you've got your hands all around it so it looks like it's um and they'll make a big thing out of it they'll just assume it is you haven't placed their card back and then you slap this hand on top with the one card because you want it to sound like it did the first time like you have a bunch of cards and you're slapping them back in place just like that uh, then I spread the cards and say, no, your card is lost somewhere in the pack. And in doing that, you're getting a break above the bottom four cards, which are the aces and the three. So as you do that, you square up. And I hold a pretty significant break with my uh, little finger in there so I don't lose it. You then uh, talk about the deck finding the cards, not you. You swing cut about half the cards into your hand. And to swing cut, you're just lifting up the first, I don't know, about half the deck with your um, right index finger and cutting it into your left hand just like that. Uh, so this is still what was the top card a minute ago. You use the right hand cards to flip over the top card because you're going to need to drop uh, those four cards in a minute. You want it to look consistent. You say the first card tells me whether your card's high or low. Well, that's an ace. That's not very helpful because that could either be high or low depending on the card game you're playing. You then use the packet of cards again in your right hand to flip this card over face down. And then I toss it on the table. I lift my hand just a little bit so they can see that the ace of spades is going into the table. Uh, now you say the next card is going to tell me the suit of your card. Now when you flip it over, it's going to be their actual card that they see. But just keep on going. Don't let them stop you and say anything about whether or not it's their card. Just keep on going. And you say, now the second card is going to tell me that's the suit of your card. This card is never wrong. It's always right. There it is, the club. So your card is, in fact, a club. And as soon as you ask that question, they're going to be a little bit, look around, be a little bit confused. Again, you're going to use the right-hand cards to flip this over. But when you do, you're going to flip this over and drop all the cards you have above the break right on top of that card, just like that. All right, so we'll run through that again. So you've got a break above the um, bottom four cards, which is the ace, the three. You flip this card over to show it's the two. You tell them it's the suit, blah, blah, blah. And you flip this over and you drop those bottom four cards on top of the two. And you toss a card on the table. So you're actually tossing one of the other aces onto the table. Uh, now you say, now the next card is going to tell me exactly where your card is uh, from this point in the deck. Now remember, you drop the three and the two aces on top of their card, placing it third from the top. So you flip this card over and say, uh, there it is, three. That tells me your card is exactly three uh, parts uh, cards down from right here in the deck. I take and I leave the three face up on top of that packet. As I toss one, two, now the two cards I'm tossing down are the other two aces. So you, you'll be where you are at the ending. And you say, uh, and, there, and the third card down, one, two, three, there it is, the two of clubs. Is that your card? Now they're going to say yes and be surprised. And I wait and wait and wait. And as I'm doing that too, I kind of clean up this. I grab the three, turn it over and place everything here. And when I do this, I usually make sure I'm a little bit farther away from the table so they know I'm not going to go near those cards again and you wait and wait and wait and somebody will pretty quickly or eventually say but I thought the card was you know one of those down there you you uh let this card down you say oh no these are the four aces and you turn it over which gets a great reaction and then I end by saying um while on the way to my luck the luckiest night of my life which is a, a line of Ricky Jays that I heard him use in a routine. Um, so there it is. It's uh, Jim Ryan's Dunbury uh, Delusion. And it's a great trick. It's a fun trick. It's easy to do. It's a wonderful trick to start off and really sets the um, uh, tone for uh, uh, the, the kind of magic that I like to do in the close-up of my magic to do, real Chicago-style close-up magic there. Um, so that's it, Biz. Uh, so, Tom, thank you very much for that. 
Yeah, my I think everybody at Volmo really enjoyed the really enjoyed that trick. Oh, great! And um, I think I think this is a great opportunity to dive into creating magic. And okay. I want you to talk a little bit about how you've created magic over the years. I mean, what ritual did you have, or how do ideas come to you? I'll pass it to you. Okay, yeah. So, uh, great question. So, um, a lot of times it was a trick that caught my interest. So, either a plot that I heard about, or something I thought about, or something that exists that I uh, would or read that I thought, well, this is a good starting point for a trick. But I think I could go this way. I think I could go that way. So that's the bulk of my cr uh, creations were that way. Like uh, the. Uh, wildcard routine that I talked about a couple of times that is going to be released was um, yeah. I uh, I wanted to be able to do that. I liked, I loved that trick, but I wanted to be able to do it walk around in all environments rather than most wildcard routines. Uh, you have to sit down, you have to lay the cards out on the table. It becomes like a whole thing. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to be able to do that trick without having to do that. So then I thought, okay, so how could I do that? And that's a classic example of when I had run through the trick in my head before I picked up the cards to do it. So this is the God's honest truth. I was sitting at a, a swimming pool with a friend of mine and her kids. And while they were doing stuff, I was running because I was working on it. I was running through the trick in my head. I thought I figured out what the sequence should be. We came back when we at the end of the day, I took out the cards and ran through it. And I had, and I had basically had the handling that it ended up being. Uh, but that's that hey. was driven. By the, yeah, but that was driven by the fact that I wanted to be able to do that trick walk around. Uh, so that's what drove that. What drove the oil and water trick was I originally only had one sequence of it. There's a sequence with four cards where it looks like they visually separate. So a friend of mine had gone to a magic lecture, and when he came back, said that he had seen an oil and water, and he described that sequence. But that sequence used gimmick cards. It was by a Chicago area magician. And I wanted to be able to do that trick without having to use gimmick cards or that sequence of the trick. So I figured out a way to do that. And then I thought, okay, so I built out the oil and water trick around that. So I had that first, and then I built out the oil and water trick. And I also set myself certain, usually, parameters when I'm creating the trick. For the oil and water, I wanted, okay. I didn't want there to be any counts to show that the card separated. So a lot of times you use an Emsley count or something and say, oh, look, they're all black when they're really not. I wanted all the displays to be, you could see all the cards basically all the time. There was none of the implied separations and i wanted it to be as visible visual as it could be so those were the goals i set for myself when creating the routine and then i just worked the routine out around those goals the last part that came to me was the ending i couldn't figure out the ending and then a friend of mine made a suggestion that i completely misinterpreted and came up with the the way to do the ending and i showed it to him and he was like livid because that wasn't what he had said but it ended up being really good uh, so in that case, I had <coughs> a part of the routine and then built out the routine around it. Um, so uh, the Big Four Poker, which I released through Big Blind 2, this is just trying to give you some examples. Use these as you feel yeah, fit. Yeah, go for it. Was a trick that I had um, uh, read in a Jim Steinmeier book. The, the basic trick was a different trick, but it was in the Jim. The, some of the points of it were in the Jim Steinmeier uh, book. And then I thought of the routine as it came out, basically. And then, so a friend of mine gave me an idea for the end of the trick with the, uh, uh, instead of it, the ending being obvious what it was, and then I predicted it to be the, the, the different ending it is today with the hodgepodge of cards that ends up being, you know, actually the, the winning hand. Um, so that all came together through, um, I was inspired by the trick in the Steinmeier booklet that I took a completely different direction, but the, the and I've talked to Jim about this since, and he said it's a completely different trick, and it's a better trick than what he had published. Nice. But um, <laughs> so uh, so that's so I mean those are three examples. So again, I don't I usually don't create from whole cloth. It's usually ideas I have from something I've seen that spawns another idea for me, and then I just try and figure out a way to do it from there. And then I'm I'm fortunate to have some good friends who are knowledgeable magicians who. I'll show early iterations of the trick too, and then we'll offer suggestions to along the way to, to improve it. And I don't always take them, the suggestions. Sometimes I think, nah, I don't like it, but it's good to get that honest feedback. So uh, most yeah, of the time of it does help and improve what you're doing. It's very and again, important. It, it's very important and then, and to also, yeah, go on, go on. 
And it also goes back to what I said earlier about having a toolbox of uh, things you can do at a knowledge base. So then when I'm creating these, I can pull from that information to, you know, apply to this. Go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to I think it's uh, important when you're also, you said that you don't always like all of the critique that you get. And yeah. this is one of the beautiful things about getting critique is that you might actually doubt your trick, but when somebody uh, tells you to change a segment of it and you go, no, I don't want to change that. That's when you know you really like that segment because yes. you don't want to change it. Right. Absolutely. So it's beautiful. And, to, and, to ask you know, you. And, the, and then they're viewing it through their lens. So you got to remember that too. They're doing it view their how they view it and they're a lot of times they're viewing it as magicians so you just need to keep that in mind too yeah <laughs> all of the times all yeah all exactly times. exactly right yeah what would what would your tips be for somebody that wants to create magic as well so the big big thing is to um know uh, know what's out there so keep a, keep aware of like magic and material that comes out there um, just start creating. Don't uh, don't hesitate because you don't think you're creative or you don't think you have good ideas or you don't not. Uh, you know you got to try it to even know if you do or not. Um, and if you have, uh, you know, to start. If you're a little hesitant to start, just start by a trick or a plot of a trick that appeals to you. Whether it be, you know, oil and water. Whether it be wild card. Whether it be a cut and restored rope. Whether it be a vanishing lady in a box. Whether it be an appearing tiger. Just something that appeals to you. Uh, start creating. Start thinking of ways that you would do it. And you know, um, uh, you know, uh, don't. And you know, don't stifle ideas. You may think, well, you know, uh, this would never work. But you don't know. And it might be a good idea. You might. It might lead you to another way that will work. So. The biggest thing I think I would say is, is um, and don't feel that you have to create something from scratch, like a, and a whole new genre of magic or a whole new effect in magic, because you're probably well, not going to be able to do that, particularly when you start. That happens, but you may not. But uh, just take some existing, uh, again, you know, area that you're interested in and just start creating and see. And a lot of, you know, you know, good percentage of what you create you may never come to fruition or it may stink but don't stop because the next one may be the one so you know start yep. doing it and keep on doing it and don't hesitate is what i would say just dive in and do it because people are much more creative than they think they are yeah because <laughs> people don't know if they don't try and when right. you don't try you the only yeah. thing that you can say is i'm not good at it <laughs> but you haven't tried Right, exactly. And maybe you're not, but you're going to get better. I can guarantee you're going to get better. Even if you end up not 100%. being in, you know, even if you're not being the most creative guy in the world, you're going to get better at it and you're going to enjoy doing it more. And don't get frustrated by it because, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I am fortunate to session with some of the really good magicians and they'll show something and, and not everything they show you is good. And you tell them that. So, no. I mean, you know, you're only seeing from these guys you think are so great and so creative. You're seeing what they the final product of was was a long process, and you're not seeing the crap that was created along the way. So no, <laughs> no, almost never. Only when you like session for six hours. And then a, yeah, exactly. Over. Which uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. All and then of you these do craps see. come out at the end. It does, because then you're like, oh, I'll show you this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, and then, and then, and then, yeah, and then try and get a group of a good people that you trust for feedback, which is harder to do than you oh. would think. It could be harder to do than you think, but much, much harder to do. Yeah. Much harder, but at the same time, much easier with the internet in the sense that, yes, I know over the years I've been um, pretty immature. And uh, there has actually been people contacting me and wanting to talk about the tricks that I created and I would just get distracted so I wouldn't answer. But uh, recently in the past two years, I've become a bit more uh, mature towards this idea. So I engage in conversations with people that want to talk about sure. even a trick that I performed that might not be mine. And I now have very good friends that I session with. but. It has to be both ways. Like you, you have to put in effort. Absolutely. 
is the internet. It's so easy to not talk with somebody and forget about them. And that's a that's but a good point. Time, I didn't, that's a go on, go on. One of the things you said is really important is, uh, and it has to be both ways. You know, uh, don't uh, you know? Don't just try and um, uh, on both sides. You know, offer advice and opinions, and don't just try and get you know, like suck information out of people. Offer something back as well. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you even if you feel like you don't have something to offer, you you probably do. Absolutely. You most agree. likely do. Honestly. Absolutely agree. Yeah. So we're reaching towards the end of the of this beautiful interview and okay. I would like to ask you let's like go back a little bit in time and I want you to imagine that your younger self is sitting next to you and this younger self can be uh, when you are 12 when you are 22 when you are 35 and you have the opportunity to give yourself, your younger self, some advice. What would be the advice that you would give yourself? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, uh, I think I probably would uh, give myself the advice to be uh, uh, be a little bit bolder and reach out more to people than I did in the past. Uh, that's been something that's come to me later in life, um, uh, as it relates to to magic and to. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's important would be to uh, reach out to be a little bit more bolder in um, reaching out to people and, and making those connections. And because uh, th those are at the end of the day, what makes uh, your magic better, what makes your life better and what lasts. So, I mean, that's yeah. the most important thing, I think, in my opinion, would be that to reach out. Don't hesitate to reach out. They're not all going to be great encounters, but to, to, to be more bolder about doing that, more intentional about reaching out and talking to people and doing it. Oh, one thing that you said, and I, I really want to squeeze this in at the end, you said sure. not all of them are going to be great. But right. the thing is that sometimes because you're having a not so great interaction with somebody, while you're having that interaction with that person, you'll end up having a great interaction or a better interaction with somebody that you didn't plan on having an interaction with. Absolutely. So things things can definitely segue. Just like you said, you you befriended Jim Ryan and Jay Marshall, and they through your interaction with them, you met other people. You know, Absolutely. and this can happen anytime, Absolutely. even if the interaction isn't so good. Absolutely, and I know those a lot of those people to this day because of that. So could, couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely right. Yep. Absolutely. So. I'm going to pass it over to you and uh, I want you to talk shortly about a couple of the things that you're doing right now. You know, tell people about the disclaimer, talk about okay. the, the reviews that you're doing and like what's Tom Dobrowalski doing right now, like for the next few months, probably. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, great question too. Um, so yeah, the the big things we're working on right now is the disclaimer, which is which was a monthly uh, e magazine periodical that we put out and continue to put out. We switch to quarterly now and are offering yeah. other stuff during the uh, off months when we're not publishing. So uh, just this past Saturday, for the supporters of the disclaimer, we had a uh, uh, a Zoom session and we had some special guests, including Chris Rollins from England, uh, John Bannon, and Michael Weber and Tim Trono joined us and shared some information and tricks with us online. Uh, but yeah, so we're we're doing that right now, the disclaimer. So the disclaimer, it's um, kind of a throwback to if you guys are remember uh, way back the Jinx or Apocalypse or Richard's Almanac, yeah. or it's just th yeah, it's three tricks a month. And that's all it is. We don't put editorials. There's no advertising. It's just three good, strong tricks a month. Uh, Curtis Cam's involved, myself, Jeremiah Zuo, who some people know, Coin Guy, Underground Coin Guy, and, and a handful of other people that are uh, involved. There's like eight or ten of us all together. And uh, publishing uh, new material, it really came out of the pandemic when we had all this material that we were creating and we were looking for an outlet for it. So we just thought, well, we'll do this for a while and see if we enjoy doing it. So uh, that uh, takes up a big chunk of time. And a couple months ago, um, this is a classic example of not asking for anything. 
a few months ago, I got an email from uh, Dustin Stinnett, who is the associate editor of Genie Magazine, asking if I'd be interested in becoming one of their trick reviewers. Uh, I ended up asking him how he even knew who I was because I couldn't figure out how they reached out to me to know. Again, that was a classic example of people knowing you that you have no idea that they even knew you existed. And uh, so he asked if I'd be interested. They asked me to submit a a sample review, obviously, because they want to make sure that you could write. And then um, he emailed me back right away and said, yeah, we'd like you to become a reviewer. And uh, uh, it turned out that Richard Kaufman is the one who made the decision and had known me throughout the years just through some stuff he had seen of me, too. So, again, a classic example of not knowing, you know, people know you. And um, that's every four every four months you do. We do reviews for Genie. So uh, it's been an interesting experience because you're getting tricks to review other people's tricks to review and you see you get an opportunity to kind of see what's out there and what's going on so it's been interesting cool. uh the second second one's appearing just like around now um i continue to session with a couple of guys and working on the releases we just had for big blind uh that'll be coming wow. out just did those uh working on combining a lot of my old uh started doing a few more lectures now that things are um uh, out and people so, are out and about so i've been putting together yeah. a or a lecture I'm going to do that I'm going to try and do more often. Uh, I, st- I published a series of uh, lecture notes and booklets over the last 12 or 13 years uh, that I pulled a lot of those out of print, and we're combining that. Uh, this is news that nobody really knows. A lot of people, people know. We're combining those hey. into a book. So we're combining all the earlier material into a book, rewriting it, re-illustrating and doing all that. So there'll be a, a bigger book coming out of some of those earlier notes and information I'll be coming out in the next couple of a year or so, probably. So uh, that's mostly what I'm working on now. And then I'm, I'm started, uh, been asked to lecture at the Chicago Magic Lounge in August. So I'm trying to put together a nice little Chicago focused uh, lecture, which I want to do. Uh, the, the big, the, and the big, um, so I'm going to have the one lecture that I'm going to do like as a core lecture. And then I am working on a larger. I did the second Penguin Live lecture I did was on the material of my mentor, Jim Ryan which was all his material, which is great stuff. But there's a large, wonderful history of Chicago magicians over the years uh, that have been forgotten. And so I'm going to put together uh, lectures. I'm working on putting together lectures of some material from all those guys. So it's more of a Chicago magic-based lecture uh, that I'll be uh, hopefully doing. And it's going to be a little bit of a while because I'm just putting that together now while I'm doing this other stuff. But that's those are the big things I'm working on now that are keeping me busy. I'm glad I retired, so I have time to do all this magic stuff. <laughs> you do. That's yeah. a lot of projects, Tom. I'm it very is. hyped it up is. for that. Yeah. Staying, so just gotta, staying young. Yeah, that, that, exactly it, Biz. That's exactly it. If I didn't do this, I'd be uh, the old guy sitting in his uh, rocker, you know, uh, bitching about it. <laughs> Pardon my language. Complaining about everything. So I don't want to become no, that guy. No, no. I don't want to become that guy. No, but it's people like you that help me that keep guy. young. I, I thrive on the energy of people like you, Biz. They help keep me young. So we uh, it, The interaction, it's, it's very essential. Yeah, honestly, appreciate it's it. Ongoing. So what are your last words for everybody watching right now? So my last words would probably be a lot of stuff we discussed earlier. I know I was all over the place, but I think the big thing I would would, uh, hope would come out of this is what you and I talked about uh, early on in this, which is really important to me, is to to continue to reach out to magicians and particularly to continue to reach out over the generations of magicians because the older guys like me are complaining magic is going in the wrong direction or it's dying out or whatever. Uh, It's just because you're living in your own little world. And, if, and do something about it. If you really feel that's the case, do something about it. So I'd encourage people across generations and, uh, you know, to reach out to each other. And when you have the opportunity to reach out to each other and spend time together in person when you can, uh, to get out there and to meet other magicians, not only online, but if you have the opportunity to get to a convention, to get to a lecture, a live lecture, to get to a magic shop, take that opportunity, introduce yourself and meet people. And uh, I would hope that down the line somewhere, any of you guys that I meet in person would come out and uh, say hello, because uh, that would be great. That would be that would make that would make my day if uh, people would uh, do that. It would be great. So that that would be my big awesome. thing is to try and pa- the older magicians to to pass it on, and the new magicians to seek out the knowledge and information. You've heard it from Tom, there our you go. guest here on Creating Magic. 
Tom, it has been fantastic. I, I honestly don't know how how the entire interview went by so fast. I, I appreciate it, Biz, and I can't thank you enough for uh, reaching out to me and doing this and allowing me to share this. It's been great. I agree 100%. I can't believe that it went by as quickly as it did. Appreciate you. So great. So great. Thank you to everybody watching, guys, and stay tuned for fifth episode where we're going to have, don't know, it's probably going to be either John Kerry, Steve Rowe, George McBride, Alan Rorson. Stay tuned, and you're going to find out. All Peace great out. Guys. Bye. Bye.